Decimals and Fractions Review. Well, the first of all, we want to answer the question, what do fractions and decimals have in common? Well, we know that fractions and decimals both are parts of a whole, so that's important to note. So if we're thinking about half of something or um, 0.3 of something. So we're not looking at a whole value, we're looking at a part of something. So a piece of a pizza, a piece of a piece of cake, um, whatever it happens to be, um, a quarter in terms of like a dollar. Um, and what we call these is we would call these rational numbers. And when we looked at integers, we looked at integers as being whole numbers um, that could be positive or negative values and also included the zero, where rational numbers are numbers uh, that can be whole numbers as well, um, but they are also numbers that include everything in between those whole numbers. Um, so that's important to note as well. So what do they have in common? They're parts of a whole and they're part of this thing called rational numbers. Well, how are they different though? Well, fractions and decimals can be the same thing. They can represent the same number, um, but they're expressed differently. So we know that fractions are, for example, 1 over 2. So we can think about the operation being division, where decimal numbers are like 0.34. Um, they're just expressed differently. So they can mean the same number, but they're expressed in a different way. And depending on how they are expressed or shown, uh, we can use um, different things with them. So let's start by working with decimal numbers to begin with. Um, the great thing about decimal numbers and values of tens, so ten, hundreds, thousands, and so on, is we can use these simple basic tricks to um, make multiplying and dividing a lot easier when we're doing um, them by base tens. So when we're thinking about these basic skills or these basic tricks. When we look at example number one, for example, we have 15 times 10. Well, how do we multiply a whole number by a value or a base of 10, so 10 or 100 and so on? Well, we're just going to write that number, but we're going to tack on how many zeros. So for 10, we're adding one zero. For 100, we're adding two zeros to that four. So that's something to think about. And when we're thinking about division, if we have a number that already starts or ends in a zero, uh, when we're dividing by a power of 10, uh, for example, 350 divided by 10, we're taking off one zero for each of those zeros that we are dividing by. So 350 divided by 10 becomes 35. 25,000 divided by 100, so we're taking off two of those zeros for 100, and we're left with 250 and so on. We can apply the same rules to decimal numbers, we just treat them differently. So when we're thinking about um, our values up here when we're looking at whole numbers or numbers that ended in a certain number of zeros, we're also thinking about where that decimal place would lie. So our 15, there would be an imaginary decimal number right beside your 15. Um, and so when we're multiplying by 10, what's happening is that decimal number gets moved over to the right one spot. Um, and so the same thing would uh, come into play when we're dealing with numbers that have many uh, different decimal place values. So when multiplying by 10, we move the decimal place one place to the right. And if we were multiplying by 100, we would move it two places to the right. If we were multiplying by 1,000, we move it three places to the right. So however many zeros are in that base of 10 uh, is what we're going to move the decimal place to the right by. When we're dividing by 10, again, if we think about these numbers up at the top in this example, 
that imaginary decimal place would be right here at the end of 350. But when we are dividing by 10, that decimal place is moved so that it's one spot to the left. So then instead of being 350, it only becomes 35. So that same, same strategy falls into place here. So when we're dividing by 10, we move the decimal place one place to the left this time. And if we were dividing by 100 or 1,000, we would move that decimal place two spots, three spots, four spots, and so on. So let's take a look at some examples, more concrete examples, so we can see what's happening here. So if I'm starting with 2.73 and I want to multiply by 10, I'm going to find this decimal place and then I'm going to move it one spot to the right. So then my new number becomes 27 decimal 3. For 0 0.58, I'm finding that decimal place. I'm multiplying by 10, so I'm moving it one spot to the right. So it becomes 5.8. So any zeros in front of that number, I no longer have to write. When I'm looking at 38 decimal 06, I'm finding that decimal place. I'm moving it one spot to the right. So then our new number becomes 380 decimal 6. And when we're dividing, we're still finding that decimal place, but instead of moving it to the right, we're going to move it to the left now. So my new number would be 19 decimal 15. For the next one, 0 decimal 987, I'm taking that decimal place, I'm moving it to the left one spot. Because um, my, I don't want to really start with a decimal point, I'm going to keep that 0 and then decimal point and then 0, 9, 8, 7. So always start to any numbers that don't have a um, whole number, like a 3 or a 5 or whatever, um, start with a 0. Okay, and then my last one, if there is no decimal point clearly displayed in your question, it's always at the very end. So I'm going to move that one spot to the left. So it's 186. You don't have to write the decimal zero at the end. Um, you could just write it as 186 and leave out that decimal zero because anytime we have that decimal zero, it's like it doesn't exist. Okay. So again, we talked about this already. So what happens when we're multiplying or dividing by 100, 1000, etc.? It just means that we move the decimal place more spaces. So more places to the left or right. So if we're looking at some more examples, I'm dividing by 100, I'm finding that decimal place. If there's one not given, I'm going to write that in. And I'm dividing, so I'm going to the left, dividing by 100, that's two zeros, moving it two spots, one decimal, three, five. 27 times 1,000, um, because there is no decimal number there, I'm going to write my 20, 27, and I'm going to add three zeros to that. For my 2.538 times 100, I'm finding my decimal place. I'm writing or moving it two spots to the right. So it becomes 253.8. 2.216 times 1,000, I move this decimal place two, three spots to the right. So it becomes 2,216. Find my decimal place. This time I'm dividing, so I'm moving to the left two spots because I'm dividing by 100. This becomes 3 decimal 1874. 19,520.6 divided by 1,000. I'm finding that decimal place. I'm moving it to the left three spots. So 1, 2, 3. It becomes 19 decimal 5206. 1.4 times 100. I'm moving it 1, 2, if there is no number there, I'm going to put an imaginary zero there. Think of this maybe as like an egg carton. So anytime you have a blank space, drop an egg in that spot. And then 2.9 divided by 10, I'm finding my decimal place. I'm moving it to the left one spot. So 0 decimal 29. 
and 7.6 divided by 100, finding that decimal place, moving it one, two spots to the left. Again, I'm adding that zero in here, um, and so it'll be 0 0.076. So those are the quick and easy ways that we can multiply by powers of tens, so tens, hundreds, thousands, and so on. Moving on, we'll take a look at fractions now. If two fractions so show the same part of a whole, then they are what we call equivalent. So what are five uh, equivalent fractions for each of the following? So when we're thinking about finding equivalent fractions, we either want to make the fractions bigger or we want to make them smaller. So 1 over 2, I can make them, this fraction, um, bigger. I can't make it any smaller because this is what we call lowest terms. So if you might remember that from grade 9. So this 1 over 2 is already in lowest terms. I can't make it any smaller, but I can write equivalent fractions by making them larger. And I make them larger by multiplying my numerator and my denominator, so my top number and my bottom number, by the same constant value. So I might want to multiply it by 2. And I get a new fraction of 2 over 4. Or I might want to multiply my fraction by 3. And whatever I do to the top number, I have to do to my bottom number. So it'll be 1 times 3 is 3, and 2 times 3 is 6. I can keep going if I wanted to. I can multiply it by 4 and then 5 and then so on. So if I'm multiplying my numerator and my denominator by 4, I get 4 over 8. I can multiply it by 5. 1 times 5 is 5 and 2 times 5 is 10. And we'll do one more. We'll multiply the numerator and the denominator by 6. 1 times 6 is 6. And 2 times 6 is 12. So that's one way to find equivalent fractions, where we multiply our numerator and our denominator by the same constant. So we can get fractions that when we reduce them back into lowest terms, we'll get back to that same equation. So for 2 over 3, we can do the same strategy where we can pick values. So in the first set of examples, we went up by 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. You can choose to go up by whatever number or multiply by whatever number you want. You can multiply them by uh, powers of 10. You can multiply them both by 10. So we get 20 over 30. You could multiply them by 100. to get 200 over 300. You could multiply them by 1,000. So you can see that it truly doesn't matter what you are multiplying by to get, get equivalent fractions as long as you multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same amount. So that's important to note. We'll do a couple more. Uh, maybe I just want to multiply them by 5 to get 10 over 15 as an option, um, and maybe I want to multiply them by 20, for example. So 2 times 20 is 40, and 3 times 20 is 60. So you can either multiply them by smaller digits, or you can go big, right? So tens, hundreds, of thousands, and so on. So we'll just uh, write um, Five quick fractions for 3 over 4, multiplying them by 2, so that gives me 6 over 8. I can multiply it by 10 to give me 30 over 40. I can multiply my 6 over 8 by 10 to give me 60 over 80. And maybe I want to multiply it by 100 to give me 300 over 400. So that's one, two, three, four fractions. We'll do one more. Um, maybe I want to multiply this by three. So three times three is nine, and four times uh, three is 12. So it doesn't matter what you multiply them by as long as you are being consistent in terms of what you're multiplying your numerator and your denominator by.
So how did we find these different equivalent fractions? Well, just to recap, we multiply the numerator and the denominator. by the same constant value. So if we want to think about though, which of these fractions is the best in this list? We might want to think about our smallest fractions, right? So we might want to think about um, saying that this 1 over 2 would be the best, or the 2 over 3 would be the best, and the 3 over 4 would be the best. Because when we're dealing with fractions, we always want to deal with the smallest version of that fraction, so that when we do operations with fractions, we are not multiplying or dividing really large numbers. It makes it easier for us to do those mental math skills, or um, even just any operation using a calculator. So which one would be considered the best? We would say uh, the first fraction, And why? Because it's in lowest terms. So remember to reduce a fraction to lowest terms, we must divide both parts of the fraction by the same number. So when we're thinking about reducing the fractions in the examples below here, we want to find a number um, that will divide evenly into both of these numbers. So we must uh, look for our greatest common factor. So the number that divides evenly, the largest number that divides evenly into 10 and 12 would be 2, okay? So I want to divide both my numerator and my denominator by the same number. So 10 divided by 2 is 5, and 12 divided by 2 is 6. There is nothing other than 1 that will divide evenly into 5 or 6, so then I know that this new fraction, 5 over 6, is in lowest terms. Then I'm going to take a look at my next fraction, 15 over 24. They're not even numbers, so I can't divide by 2, but I could divide them by 3. So I'm going to go ahead and divide both my numerator and my denominator by 3. 15 divided by 3 is 5, and 24 divided by 3 is 8. Again, 5 over 8 is in lowest terms because there is no number other than 1 that will divide evenly into 5 and 8. Sometimes you'll be able to go right from your larger fraction to lowest terms in one step, and that's great if you can figure out what that greatest common factor is. If you need to do multiple steps, that is perfectly fine. So we'll do multiple steps um, for number 24, 24 over 36. So you might say, hey, these are both even numbers, so I can divide these by 2. So 24 divided by 2 is 12, and 36 divided by 2 is 18. But you might say to yourself, well, 12 over 18 are still both um, even numbers, so I'm going to divide these by 2 even more. So I'm going to do another step. So 12 divided by 2 is 6, and 18 divided by 2 is 9. Now, they're not even numbers anymore, but it's still not quite in lowest terms, it's because I can divide 6 and 3, or 6 and 9 by 3. So 6 divided by 3 gives me 2, and 9 divided by 3 gives me uh, 3.
So my fraction in lowest terms is 2 over 3. So you can find um, your lowest terms sometimes by doing multiple steps. Um, or you might have said, hey, I can divide both of these numbers by 12. 24 divided by 12 is 2, and 36 divided by 12 is 3, and get right to that final answer in that one step. That's perfectly fine. Another thing that you might be able to use if you've learned how to do this or if you have this button on your calculator, it's not on all calculators, um, if you have a scientific calculator um, that has a button that looks like this. So your button on your calculator looks generally looks like an A and then a B over C. This is a button here that will reduce fractions for you. So the way this works is that you are going to enter in your numerator, your 88, and then you're going to press that ABC button, and then you're going to enter in your denominator, your 100, and it'll give you that answer in lowest terms. So when you press equals, it gives you a value of 22 over 25 and that is your fraction in lowest terms. So if you have this ABC button on your scientific calculator, you are welcome to use that for numbers that, or fractions that are, tend to have larger numbers. But it's also important to practice using those mental math skills or your um, factors. So when you're thinking about your times tables, when you learn those in elementary school, if you are really good at that, reducing fractions is a lot easier as well. So we'll do one more example. 25 over 150. Both of these can be divided by 25. 25 divided by 25 is 1. And 150 divided by 25 um, gives me 6. And so these are my fractions in lowest terms. If you have any questions about this lesson, please reach out, send me an email, or sign up for a virtual help session, and I will see you in the next lesson.